Alors, bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être avec nous aujourd'hui. Bienvenue dans le royaume du Saguenay. Saguenay, c'est tout. Lac-Saint-Jean, c'est un autre royaume. Ça, ça me fait plaisir d'être votre animateur aujourd'hui. Je suis Jean-François Boucher, professeur en éco-conseil ici, évidemment membre du CEF. Et c'est avec grande, grande joie qu'on vous reçoit euh, ici après... après... Est-ce que c'est la première fois que nous recevons le CEF? C'est la première fois que nous recevons euh, les membres du CEF, donc pour le colloque annuel. Ça nous fait doublement plaisir. Donc, euh, merci d'être là en grand nombre. C'est un grand succès déjà par le nombre et puis euh, par euh, l'étendue des âges aussi. <rire> et euh, je ne vais pas parler beaucoup. En fait, vous savez, mon rôle d'animateur, c'est d'assurer la fluidité de la chose et modérer euh, les questions. Et donc, d'emblée, euh, je vais laisser la parole à notre euh, doyen de la recherche et de la création de l'Université du Québec à Chicoutimi, M. Yves Chiricotta, pour un mot de bienvenue. Merci. Comme je l'ai dit euh, au directeur euh, du centre, je vais essayer de me limiter à trois heures maximum. <rire> non, en fait, ça va être quelques minutes. Euh, comme euh, je suis de tout cœur avec Jean-François pour vous souhaiter la bienvenue euh, à l'université. Effectivement, c'est la première fois qu'on reçoit euh, le, le colloque du CEF, donc euh, nous sommes très heureux, d'autant plus que nous sommes une région entourée de forêts, donc ça tombe bien, c'est comme euh, une bonne association. Euh, donc, euh, hier, j'ai regardé le programme, je ne suis pas, vraiment pas un spécialiste là, de la forêt, je suis plutôt un utilisateur, euh, j'aime beaucoup les arbres et tout ça. Ah, et j'ai constaté l'étendue des disciplines qui, qui, euh, qui interviennent là, dans l'étude de, de, de cette, euh, cet écosystème, de 16 écosystèmes. Il y a, pas, il y a la forêt, il y a les, les forêts aussi. Là. Un peu, moi, je suis mathématicien. Il y a la mathématique et les mathématiques. Là, il y a des grands débats. Est-ce qu'on dit là ou là? En tout cas, bref, euh, en ce qui concerne la forêt, vous êtes des spécialistes. Là, je ne répondrai pas à la question ce matin. Euh, donc, c'est un système complexe qui fait intervenir une multitude de, de, de disciplines. On y retrouve beaucoup d'organismes vivants. Bon, je ne vous apprends rien jusqu'à présent. Puis, hier soir, je me demandais ben, de quoi je vais leur parler en cinq minutes. Là. Euh, puis, euh, bon, je suis allé me balader sur Internet, puis j'ai découvert quelque chose qui m'a intrigué. Puis, euh, en, euh, enfin, il y a de la recherche qui euh, semble démontrer, puis là, bon, c'est un peu controversé, là, mais que euh, les forêts pourraient penser. Ça, 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 je trouvais ça assez étonnant. Donc, il y a des chercheurs qui travaillent sur l'intelligence des arbres, l'intelligence des forêts. Bon, il y aurait des, pro des processus chimiques là, qui font que les forêts pensent. Puis là, je me demandais, ben, à quoi pourrait penser une forêt là, quand je disais ça? Enfin, je n'ai pas trouvé de réponse, là, mais j'ai trouvé ça intriguant. Euh, puis, euh, bon, je n'irai pas plus loin parce qu'à un moment donné, ben, comme mathématicien, je me demandais est-ce qu'une est qu fo forêt pourrait penser à des mathématiques, par exemple? Probablement pas, mais euh, en tout cas, j'en sais absolument rien. Euh, donc, avant de. Ben, en fait, puis, bon, je sens que je m'aventure peut-être sur un terrain glissant. Là, J'ai compris en lisant un petit peu euh, quelques documents sur le net que c'est un sujet controversé, mais je trouvais l'idée plaisante de dire que peut-être que la forêt. En tant, en tant qu'organisme qu euh, est doté d'une certaine forme de pensée, bon, on, on pense beaucoup aux exoplanètes, mais peut-être que déjà sur notre planète, il y a des formes d'intelligence qu'on ne connaît pas. Puis, euh, bon, j'arrête là-dessus, je vous laisse réfléchir à ça, je pense qu'on pourrait en débattre longtemps. Euh, mais, bon, les forêts peuvent-elles penser ou non, on ne le sait pas. Cependant, euh, vous allez constater, euh, disons, durant votre séjour ici, qu'on peut faire de la musique à partir des forêts. Donc, à la galerie L'œuvre de l'autre, il y a une exposition, un, c'est un étudiant en biologie euh, qui, a, euh, qui utilise les cercles de croissance des arbres pour générer de la musique. Ça, ça c'est assez intéressant, là, parmi les... Les choses à voir ici euh, durant le colloque, là, je vous invite à visiter la galerie de l'université qui s'appelle « L'œuvre de l'autre ». Et vous allez pouvoir entendre là, ces merveilleuses mélodies. Euh, je suis allé hier sur Internet, là, sont, sont en ligne et c'est vraiment intéressant. Il y a une exposition, donc euh, 
bon, vous êtes ici pour travailler, évidemment, mais il ne faut pas oublier qu'il faut s'amuser un peu. Donc, il euh, y, y a la galerie Love de l'autre qui, qui est là pour ça. Et euh, aussi, il euh, y a une soirée sociale là, qui va se dérouler à la pulperie. Donc, c'est la partie un peu plus euh, conviviale du colloque où vous aurez l'occasion de socialiser. Puis, euh, entre autres, de goûter une bière qui a été... Euh, euh, élaboré là, euh, spécialement pour vous. C'est une bière, je crois, à base de sapin euh, qui a été brassée pour le colloque. Là. Donc ça, c'est une autre partie intéressante. Là. Je suis sûr que peut-être les directeurs, les, les organisateurs euh, aimeraient mieux que je parle là, des, du, du contenu des conférences, mais vous allez être là-dedans toute la journée. Là. Donc, il euh, n'y a pas trop de problèmes à ce niveau-là. Il, il y a aussi des excursions qui sont prévues. Euh, il y a un certain nombre d'excursions qui tournent autour de l'ornithologie, euh, production de bleuets, etc., donc, tout ça dans le colloque. Et puis, euh, je ne prendrai pas plus de votre temps. Là. Je vous remercie d'être ici, encore une fois. Euh, je remercie les organisateurs, euh, Sergio Rossi, Cornelia Crasé, euh, il y a Esther Laprise, euh, qui s'occupe de, de, de la dimension événementielle, euh, le personnel du CEF aussi, qui euh, se sont impliqués dans l'organisation. Euh, vraiment, merci à tout le monde. On est vraiment content de, de vous avoir ici. Puis, euh, bon, moi, contrairement à Jean-François, je parle euh, ici au saguenay lac saint jean <coughs> euh, Je suis originaire du lac, là, malgré mon nom. Bon, euh, mon nom, c'est Chéri Cotta, là, mais euh, je, suis, euh, je suis né à Roberval. Euh, bon, c'est en tout cas. Euh, je, on était les, la, les Chéri Cotta de Roberval, là, il y avait juste nous autres, il y a, au travers de Tremblay-Bouchard-Gagnon. Bref, euh, merci d'être ici. Puis, euh, ben, je vous souhaite un, un excellent colloque, puis euh, on espère vous revoir euh, régulièrement là, pour toutes sortes d'activités euh, scientifiques, évidemment, puis euh, ben, aussi touristiques. Donc, merci à tout le monde, bon colloque, et puis euh, profitez-en. Bon, bien, on, maintenant, on va céder la place à nos deux co-directeurs euh, du Centre d'études de la forêt, donc Louis Bernier et Pierre Drapeau. Merci. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut partir de la présentation? OK. Euh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, on est très heureux d'être euh, pour la première fois à l'Université du Québec à Chicoutimi pour la tenue euh, de la 13e édition de ce colloque annuel euh, du Centre d'études de la forêt. Et oui, ça fait, euh, ça fait maintenant, euh, depuis 2006, qu'on est financé. Et, euh, et le centre comme tel... Ah, merci. Euh, a comme objectif, évidemment, et pour ça, c'est pour le rappeler aussi à, à tous les ans, on a de nouveaux arrivants, soit de nouveaux ou de nouvelles chercheurs qu'on va avoir l'occasion d'entendre aujourd'hui, mais de nouveaux et de nouvelles étudiantes euh, et, euh, et étudiants qui euh, viennent... Euh, qui sont en fait le, le tissu euh, le plus important au Centre d'études de la forêt. On, on a créé ce centre-là pour former les gens euh, au deuxième, troisième cycle, puis euh, et également d'accueillir les stagiaires postdoctoraux. Et notre mission, c'est bel et bien de comprendre le rôle fonctionnel des organismes et des processus dynamiques de la forêt et d'utiliser cette connaissance-là scientifique qui est souvent fondamentale pour la transposer en application au niveau de stratégies d'aménagement euh, et de pratiques d'aménagement forestier qui sont innovantes. On travaille évidemment, on le rappelle à tous, autour de ces quatre grands axes-là. Ce qui est particulier du Centre d'études de la forêt, c'est vraiment cette idée de comprendre la forêt sous divers champs disciplinaires. Et on a historiquement travaillé davantage dans le domaine des sciences naturelles. On est quand même financé par le Fonds de recherche Québec, Nature et Technologie. Mais on travaille aussi de plus en plus dans les enjeux qui sont reliés à des enjeux de société et de relations forêt-société, comme on va le voir euh, dans la suite de ce cours exposé. 
Dans les six dernières années, il y a eu quand même beaucoup de développement. Et pourquoi je parle des six dernières années? Parce que vous n'êtes pas sans savoir qu'on était en renouvellement de financement. Le Centre d'études de la forêt est financé par le programme des regroupements stratégiques du Fonds de recherche euh, en nature et technologie. Et ce fonds de recherche-là euh, euh, finance une infrastructure de recherche comme le CEF sur, une base, sur la base de six ans. Et dans les six dernières années, on a beaucoup continué à travailler, notamment en forêt publique, euh, mais on a développé beaucoup, beaucoup au niveau de la forêt privée, au niveau de la forêt tempérée. Donc, on travaillait beaucoup en forêt boréale, mais on travaille de plus en plus aussi en forêt feuillue. Et on travaille de plus en plus aussi dans les villes. Et la forêt, elle est partout. Si on regarde, la, et des fois, elle n'est pas suffisamment bien représentée à des endroits stratégiques, à des endroits qui sont habités. Et euh, c'est un des, des grands euh, objectifs qu'on a pour les prochains six ans de, de continuer à développer de cette façon-là. Ce qui fait que l'expertise du CEF est en train de se développer sur plusieurs fronts. Euh, on parlait de forêt publique, on, parlait de change, on parle de changement climatique, mais on parle aussi de mode de vie des Premières Nations. On a de plus en plus de gens qui travaillent sur les questions de qu'est-ce qui se passe avec les communautés locales qui vivent en forêt, et entre autres les communautés des Premières Nations. Bon, ça, cet acétate-là résume un petit peu comment on a structuré la demande de financement du CEF cette année. On était en renouvellement pour un, un troisième cycle de financement de six ans. On a reçu hier la réponse du FRQNT, donc on, est, on vous la livre aujourd'hui. On a eu d'excellentes nouvelles. En fait, on est financé au maximum de ce qu'on pouvait obtenir euh, à travers ce programme-là de financement. On, est, on va être financé à partir de 600 000 l'an prochain. Donc, on est très fiers de, de ce résultat-là et, et, et on vous le relance. C'est votre contribution, c'est votre travail, c'est comment on a structuré la demande autour de ces thèmes-là qui a fait en sorte qu'on a été très bien évalué par le comité visiteur au mois de janvier. La façon dont ça fonctionne, on soumet une demande à l'automne. Euh, ceux qui ont été amenés à lire la demande, les membres réguliers qui l'ont qui reçu, c'est une demande volumineuse qui fait état des réalisations de toutes les équipes et qui, je vous dirais, s'est beaucoup appuyé sur ces pilier de notre centre. On est un centre qui fait de la recherche fondamentale et de la recherche appliquée. On est un centre qui croit beaucoup à l'interdisciplinarité et à la collaboration interuniversitaire. Et ça, je pense que c'est... On a réussi à le bâtir dans ces 13 années-là, à bâtir une confiance entre les équipes de recherche et au fait de sortir de ses propres murets institutionnels pour établir des collaborations et on est aussi fortement, en, fortement emprunt de cette idée que la collaboration avec les agences de recherche en forêt, qu'il s'agisse de la direction de la recherche forestière et des, et des équipes du ministère Forêt, Fonds et Parc ou de Ressources naturelles Canada, c'est des ponts qui sont très importants pour nos étudiants. Souvent, vous, plusieurs d'entre vous êtes co-dirigés par des, euh, des chercheurs universitaires et des chercheurs gouvernementaux. Et ça, ça vous donne une porte d'entrée incroyable sur, euh, sur ces agences-là, sur les mandats qu'ils qu ont. Et on considère que ça, c'est vraiment une, une façon opérationnelle de former du personnel hautement qualifié qui va être amener à travailler sur des enjeux qui sont très réels dans le domaine de, euh, des sciences forestières. Donc, on est très, très fiers que ces éléments-là aient été reconnus par le comité visiteur qui, euh, on, vous savez, on est sur les 11 centres, je pense, qui étaient en renouvellement. Il y a deux centres qui ont obtenu cette subvention-là maximale, donc le CEF est un des deux. Le CEF, ça regroupe 76 chercheurs réguliers présentement. Et aujourd'hui, on, on en accueille six nouveaux. Il y, en a, il y a quatre personnes qui vont venir présenter leurs travaux. On est répartis dans 11 universités, dans quatre pôles. 
On a aussi une très, bonne, une très bonne collaboration avec des chercheurs associés, principalement des chercheurs gouvernementaux, mais également des professeurs d'universités qui ne sont pas au Québec, qui ne peuvent pas être membres réguliers, mais qui sont des membres collaborateurs. Et c'est fantastique d'avoir ce réseau-là de collaborateurs à l'échelle nationale et internationale. Et le CEF, c'est vous. C'est plus de 65 stagiaires postdoctoraux, 210 étudiants au doctorat et 190 étudiants à la maîtrise. Donc, c'est beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de gens intéressés à la forêt. Et c'est incontournable que ce centre-là ne pourrait pas fonctionner sans ces neuf professionnels de recherche qui, euh, qui ont euh, collaboré, qui continuent à collaborer très étroitement en soutien à la recherche. Les six personnes qui sont nouvellement admises au centre. Aujourd'hui, on va avoir l'occasion d'entendre Audrey Maheu de l'Université du Québec en Outaouais, Guillaume de La Fontaine de Lucar, Marie Guitoni de Lucat, Jérôme Duprat, malheureusement, est en congé de... Ben, malheureusement, heureusement pour lui, il est en congé de paternité, mais malheureusement pour nous, on ne pourra pas le voir, ça va être partie remise à l'an prochain. Olivier Sonentag, Oliver Sonentag, dis-je, donc de l'Université de Montréal, et Juan Carlos Villarreal, qui est de l'Université Laval. Donc, on aura l'occasion d'avoir de, 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 des présentations de quatre de ces six personnes euh, qu'on va avoir immédiatement après la, la conférence de notre conférencier euh, invité. Nos professionnels de recherche, euh, on vous les montre. Euh, on, ils sont dans la salle. Plusieurs d'entre eux sont dans la salle. Certains n'y sont pas parce qu'ils sont ailleurs ou en congé. Euh, je crois que Hermine est en congé de maternité, si je ne m'abuse. Donc, euh, donc, certaines personnes ne sont pas là, mais euh, ils sont tous avec vous de cœur. Et ça, ça nous amène à un moment qui est peut-être moins rigolo. Cette semaine, on a appris le décès de notre collègue Frédéric Rollier euh, de l'Université Laval. Et je vais laisser euh, Louis euh, dire quelques mots. Euh, vous l'avez sans doute lu si vous avez consulté la page web du CEF. Euh, on est, on est bouleversé de l'annonce. Et c'est est vraiment avec regret qu'on va, on va quand même souligner euh, sa mémoire. Il, il a été une personne euh, excessivement marquante pour le développement du CEF et avec une expertise très unique. Euh, merci, Pierre. Euh, effectivement, si vous avez... Euh, oh, oui. Donc, on a repris un peu le, le texte qu'on a mis dans le, dans le site euh, web du CEF. Euh, évidemment, les, les, les nouveaux arrivés, vous n'avez probablement jamais rencontré Frédéric parce qu'il euh, combattait la maladie euh, depuis déjà un certain temps. Euh, moi, c'est une photo de lui que j'aime beaucoup parce que euh, Frédéric avait un peu cet air de, parfois de sortir d'une boîte à surprise. Euh, ceux qui le connaissent, ceux qui l'ont côtoyé, au, soit au CEF ou au département, ont, ont souvent vu ce visage. Mais c'était quelqu'un qui avait un esprit critique très aiguisé. Et, et c'était quelqu'un qui était très apprécié et très respecté euh, également. Euh, Pierre a mentionné tout à l'heure les collaborations interuniversitaires et Frédéric était euh, vraiment un, un, un exemple à ce chapitre-là. Euh, C'était quelqu'un qui était, évidemment, à cause de son expertise, il était appelé à, à travailler avec beaucoup de gens, mais, mais suite, euh, enfin, suite à son décès, on a aussi constaté, euh, vous le voyez ici, euh, l'émotion que ça a suscité chez beaucoup de gens. Et ça, c'était, je pense, un très bel hommage à cette personnalité qu'il y avait, euh, Frédéric. Donc, euh, alors voilà, c'est pour ça qu'on voulait lui, euh, lui rendre cet hommage. Euh, c'était, comme c'est quelqu'un du point de vue scientifique très fort, c'était un, un, un excellent mentor pour les étudiants, donc qui va être euh, évidemment très difficile à remplacer. Euh, donc, voilà pour toi, Frédéric. Euh, on continue. Alors, donc, euh, encore là, si vous, si vous n'avez jamais visité le site web du CEF, là, vous avez un problème. Euh, parce que tout le monde le fait. Euh, le, site web, un, le site web du CEF, comme vous le savez, c'est l'endroit où on retrouve euh, euh, toutes les informations, en fait, non seulement sur les activités du CEF, mais sur ce qui, ce qui se fait euh, en foresterie, euh, je dirais, sur la planète. Euh, D'ailleurs, euh, Pierre Racine tient des statistiques euh, euh, généralement très à jour sur le site et euh, le taux de fréquentation euh, est toujours euh, très important 
Encore là, deux gens un peu partout qui viennent voir ce que nous faisons, mais aussi euh, les offres d'emploi, etc. Euh, si vous n'avez pas fait votre page web, faites-la, surtout pour les étudiants. C'est une très bonne vitrine euh, en attendant que vous ayez 60 publications à votre actif. Euh, C'est une très bonne façon de vous faire connaître, de faire connaître vos projets. Euh, vos intérêts, et c'est tout à votre avantage de le faire. Alors, ben, je parlais de statistiques, justement, il y a plus de 300 personnes qui visitent le site à chaque jour, et euh, beaucoup de ces gens-là sont des gens de l'extérieur. Alors, euh, on a parlé euh, du travail de nos professionnels. Ben, une des activités que font nos professionnels, c'est entre autres d'organiser des formations euh, pour les membres, alors que ce soit, par exemple, sur les bases de données, les systèmes d'information géographique, en télédétection, euh, nous avons des gens qui s'intéressent à R et qui sont euh, très bons dans R. Euh, plusieurs de nos membres, également, euh, offrent des, des, des écoles d'été récurrentes. Alors, vous en avez ici une liste euh, de celles qui sont euh, enfin, implantées depuis longtemps et qui seront encore données certaines, je, ou peut-être même toutes sont données euh, cette année. J'en connais certaines d'entre elles. Euh, alors, le colloque annuel, ben, c'est on, on, devenu, je, je dirais, vraiment un incontournable euh, dans le monde des sciences forestières au Québec. C'est le colloque le plus important dans le domaine. Bon, peut-être que cette année, le Carrefour Forêt, euh, c'est un événement particulier. Mais sinon, euh, sur une base annuelle, euh, c'est vraiment ici que ça se passe. Et c'est une occasion encore là pour euh, nos chercheurs, mais encore là pour les étudiants, de présenter vos travaux devant des auditoires intéressés et... Euh, qui vont vous poser plein de questions. Alors, et j'en profite pour mentionner la séance d'affiches. Alors, soyez là. Et euh, évidemment, il y a le prix pour la meilleure affiche. Alors, à tous les gens ici, n'oubliez surtout pas de voter euh, pour votre affiche euh, préférée. Euh, demain, nous aurons une table ronde. Euh, comment concilier les différentes fonctions de la forêt pour les prochaines générations en espérant qu'on trouve une réponse positive. Alors, euh, Alison Monson euh, participera à, la, à cette euh, table ronde, hein, ainsi que Nicolas Meigueux, euh, Manuel kakwa kurtness et Laurie Wallet. Oh, Sylvain Chouinard et euh, c'est Olivier Riffon donc, qui animera la table ronde. Donc, c'est un rendez-vous euh, demain après-midi à l'amphithéâtre ici. Euh, alors, alors l'an dernier, euh, nos professionnels avaient lancé euh, une idée euh, d'innover et d'ajouter une journée d'atelier. Alors, euh, ça a été un franc succès. Alors, cette année, on répète, euh, répète l'événement. Et en plus, il y a même une sortie. Oups, elle n'est pas là. Alors, en plus, ben, pour ceux qui préfèrent aller sur le terrain, ben, il y a une sortie de terrain. Donc, alors, vendredi, il y aura encore beaucoup d'activités dans la région. Euh, restez jusqu'à la fin si vous voulez avoir vos prix de présence. Euh, et pour ce faire, ben, vous devez déposer votre cocarde dans la boîte avant la fin du colloque. Euh, pour les... Je pense que tantôt, Pierre faisait référence à l'âge. Alors, pour les plus jeunes, mais même certains plus vieux, alors, euh, ben, vous avez tout, toutes les formations sur vos appareils mobiles et intelligents. Et nous vous rappelons et nous vous demandons d'avoir l'intelligence de fermer vos appareils euh, durant les présentations. Alors, euh, évidemment, euh, participer à un colloque sans accès à la Wi-Fi aujourd'hui, ce serait pratiquement impensable. Alors... Euh, vous avez déjà constaté que le Wi-Fi fonctionne bien ici. Merci à nos partenaires. Alors, il y en a plusieurs, donc euh, c'est très apprécié euh, de notre part. Ça nous permet d'avoir euh, un colloque euh, intéressant et bien organisé. J'en profite déjà pour euh, remercier aussi nos hôtes. On le fera encore à la fin du colloque, mais euh, jusqu'ici, euh, nous sommes très contents d'être dans la région. Dans mon cas, j'étais venu avant, mais à l'époque du, euh, du réseau Ligniculture Québec. On peut d'ailleurs peut-être mentionner que euh, dans les bonnes nouvelles également, euh, le, le, la, la deuxième nouvelle édition du Réseau Ligne Culture Québec a été financée. Alors, euh, euh, oui, donc Nicolas, Réseau d'innovation, donc Nicolas Bélanger et Nelson Tifo étaient les promoteurs. Je pense que Jean-François ici est en fait partie. Donc, ça, c'est des bonnes nouvelles aussi. Alors, euh, donc, bon colloque à tous et euh, sans plus tarder, ben, je... Ouais, je, je, ouais, je rappelle. Euh... Euh, oui, Edurome fonctionne très bien. Euh, si jamais il y en a qui n'ont qui pas fait les étapes d'adhésion à Edurome, il y a un autre lien Wi-Fi, là, mais c'est absolument pas euh, euh, sexy comme, comme euh, mot de passe et tout ça. Donc, je vous invite à aller chercher un petit papier euh, qui donne les détails de branchement pour ceux qui n'ont pas Edurome. 
Euh, je vais juste euh, maintenant vous présenter ma collègue Annie Delaurier qui va venir présenter notre conférencier invité du colloque. Bonjour tout le monde, merci de votre présence. Alors, notre conférencier cette année est euh, Maurizio Mencuccini, que c'est un écophysiologiste euh, de formation. Maurizio a obtenu une laurée en sciences forestières à Florence, en Italie, euh, et un doctorat conjoint euh, Florence et l'Université d'Édimbourg en euh, 1995. Ensuite, il a été professeur pendant près de 20 ans à l'Université d'Édimbourg. Il travaille maintenant en Espagne au Centre de recherche de l'Université autonome de Barcelone, où il est professeur-chercheur gra grâce à la fondation ICREA de la Catalogne. Durant son parcours, il a aussi été professeur invité à la Cornwell University aux États-Unis, au Commonwealth Scientific and Research Organization, le CIRO du gouvernement australien, et à euh, l'University of Western Sydney. Mauricio Mencuccini travaille actuellement à la frontière entre les sciences biologiques et environnementales et sur l'écologie et les changements globaux. Récemment, ses recherches portent sur les relations hydriques chez les arbres et sur l'impact du stress hydrique sur l'écophysiologie des arbres en milieu forestier, euh, tempéré et méditerranéen. Il participe à des projets très innovateurs de recherche en utilisant la nanotechnologie pour développer de nouveaux modèles de sensors de flux de sève dans les arbres en, coll en collaboration avec des groupes de recherche des États-Unis et de l'Angleterre. Au cours de sa carrière, il a publié euh, un total de 200 articles scientifiques. Donc, on accueille Maurizio Mencuccini qui va nous présenter sa conférence « Forest Response to Drought from Tissue to Biosphere ». Um, so many thanks for being here. Uh, thanks to Annie for the very nice introduction. Uh, thanks to the Center for the Research on the Forest for inviting me here. Thanks for the organizers for this uh, conference. I'm looking forward to uh, listen to your presentations. I, as, as Annie just said, I, I am currently working in Spain. I am Italian and I spent most of my career in uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, I, when I moved to Catalonia, I had to learn Spanish as well as Catalan, so I'm currently a little bit rusted with regard to my knowledge of French. And so if you forgive me, I will do my uh, talk in English. I had a great time here so far. I want to give my thanks to uh, Annie Delaurier and Sergio, Sergio Rossi for taking care of me during these days. We went to visit a uh, forest for the production of maple syrup uh, the other day which was very interesting, I really appreciate it. It brought together a number of things that span from plant physiology all the way to production of products in the forest and uh, non-timber products, in fact. And uh, very surprisingly, when we were there, a couple of Italian tourists showed up. So I thought I had uh, met already all the Italians living in Quebec. It turns out there are some more who actually come specifically to visit your maple syrup forest. So it's really incredible. I really, I really felt there is almost an invasion of Italians here. Okay, so uh, and the topic of my talk is um, reflects a bit of my experience and my uh, interest over over the time with regard to. Um, uh, uh, topics that span from really plant physiology all the way up to the modeling and the uh, understanding of the behavior of ecosystems and then really at la even larger scales. And so that's more or less um, what I will going to talk about. It's a bit, a bit, a bit uh, about my history or how I developed over time and the sort of interest that I have developed. And so when I, when I began and I was a, a student, there was talk of climate change and it was all about changing in temperatures and possibly rainfall. Then we learned that uh, it wasn't just uh, the temperature getting uh, warmer and uh, possibly having uh, less rainfall in some places or more rainfall in other places. It was about uh, having to worry about extreme events, you know, things that happen occasionally, 
but they have a very large impact because of the uh, magnitude of the event itself relative to the long-term means. Then we learned that, in fact, uh, ecosystems or entire biomes can have tipping points, and we started to worry about whether these tipping points may, in fact, turn entire biomes into uh, something different from what they currently are. Then we learned that things could get even worse, and that we multiple tipping points could in interact uh, with one another, it could lead to positive cascades, and then to mega catastrophes. So uh, the more we study, the more we learn, the, the more necessarily we become worried about things that might go wrong with, uh, with our planet. And uh, so when I prepared the talk before coming here, I looked a bit at the literature and I decided to focus on this and uh, uh, statistics of um, the cost of damage of hurricanes in the US last year in 2017. And the, uh, just in that one year, uh, the statistics were in very in worried with regard to the magnitude of the economic damage that was caused by these hurricanes. Then I came over here and somebody said, well, look, down here there is a big flooding going on this year. And that's probably just as, as bad as, you know, it's going to be quite, quite costly as well to rem remedy. And so again, this, uh, every time you go to places, you realize that this, these things are really are happening. And then it's not just people becoming rewarded. I showed you before a cartoon of people protesting. And in the cartoon, there was a, uh, also a, a couple of, a photo of people protesting in London. In London, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, about 300 people got, uh, got uh, arrested, got stopped by police because they, they were trying to block the action of, of the uh, finance district in London. So it's not just the industry, the people becoming worried there, it's also the industry, of course, uh, in paying attention now. And uh, this uh, is a piece of, of news recently from a mega uh, insurance company that uh, had to underwrite a massive loss due to those uh, hurricane events. You know? They claim they can, they can withstand uh, these mega catastrophes. But uh, already last year, they had to underwrite uh, you know, in, in excess of uh, billions of dollars for, for the hurricane events. OK, so I guess I suppose similar sort of worries probably uh, take place for the forestry industry in terms of the worry about uh, potential future risks and how do you ensure against those risks. OK, so we zoom in. Of course, this, that's kind of the background. And my, my specific interest is um, then providing the, uh, the knowledge at an ecological level to help uh, frame our choices as a society. And that's what we all do here. And so and nonetheless, that debate on the background uh, remains important to keep the context and also remains important to then understand how we can frame our research in the long term in terms of, of, uh, of um, a, a playing an active role in that debate. And this is especially important for for you as a student. And so I will, I will talk about um, uh, three things primarily. I will talk about uh, 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 traits, uh, plant level uh, properties that are important in affecting the behavior of plants. And specifically, I will focus on the example of, of water-related traits, the traits that affect the water used by plants, also their response to stress. And these are very linked to also things like photosynthesis and growth, of course. And then I, I will zoom in on and, and tell you a little bit more about these uh, traits with regard to how this provides some uh, background to allow us to understand plant behavior. And then I will, I will try and see whether in the final part, whether we can use this trait to in, in models to allow us to make predictions. And so again, here there is this kind of uh, dialogue between these two elements. You know, we study to understand processes, and then we want to make predictions at the end of the day. We want to produce some knowledge which is useful for society. And so that's, there is a dialogue, and there, is, there are also points of contact and conflicts between these two objectives. And so what tools do we have? We have lots of tools. Uh, we start from the omics world down at the very bottom, um, from genomics, um, proteomics, and metabolomics, etc. So this is one very small example. One of my PhD students, Sarah, who finished last year, she was interested in studying mortality of, of trees in response to drought, and then she used metabolomics as a tool. 
And now we have we are at a stage where we can probe these questions. You know, why do trees die? What are the metabolic pathways that go wrong just before death? And uh, and so you can really begin to zoom in and and trying to say, well, these are the particular pathways that appear to be particularly affected just before death. Then at a higher level, uh, there are lots of people who have spent decades at the ecophysiological scale trying to provide information about the properties, which we call normally traits these days, that affect plant behavior. You know? And, and uh, we produce an, a, an enormous amount of information, and normally they get uh, then deposited in one of these deposited this, uh, this this particular database here is called the tri and there's a plant trait database and uh, as it says there it, it its aims are to provide an archive of plant traits so I, g I give this talk every year so every year i look up the website and so two years ago in 17 we were down to about uh, three millions plant traits last year it was five millions and this year is 11 million records of plant traits it was 50,000 in 17, it was 100,000. Last year, 3,000 species, 300,000 species this year. So the, it goes up exponentially, the amount of records uh, that are present in, in these data databases and really allow to provide more and more a global coverage of the variability in the traits, the important traits of plants uh, globally. And then networks, you know, we are capable of nowadays of establishing large networks. Um, and this one is one example that relates to genetic diversity, the conservation of genetic diversity in Europe. It's uh, uh, tens of thousands of plots, uh, all described. We have the capacity for all these plots to receive remote sensing information about their status, their biomass, their height, uh, the, f the greenness level, the physiological status, etc. And then, uh, and then one of the questions now we, we begin to go up in scale is how do we phenotype all these plots? How c is that possible? How do we provide information about the current uh, phenotype for particular traits in a scale that covers uh, tens of species and hundreds of plots or thousands of plots? Uh, and so that's where we, we go up in scale. We begin to have challenges in using the other methods at, uh, like the omics or the physiology approach. And then we go up a scale, and the last tool I'm going to briefly mention is, of course, remote sensing. Uh, this is the European uh, Space Agency plants, and they have a, a, a set of instruments that are, are, uh, they st uh, were active in the past. They, they are currently active. They will be planned. They are planned for the future, and they span, they span a range of, of topics and uh, activities. You know, and that's true, of course, for, for North America as well. And so then the final, the final one then is that tries to bring, bring it all together is, is modeling. And so uh, we have a range of spatial scales. The, it's also a range of temporal scales at which we work. And so and that's the axis here. And so we go, we go from this very small scale where the physiologists work, and then we go to scales which have to do with the tree or the forest or the landscape um, uh, catchments, and then we attempt to grow global. And so as we do that, the balance of these tools uh, changes. Now, uh, down here is mostly data-driven attempt to integrate processes, uh, whereas when we go to the globe here, a larger spatial scale is primarily modeling. If we work a lo lo longer temporal scales, then we have ac access to you know, lar uh, uh, inventory plots or large networks of plots. And then if you go to global scales, then it's more and more to do with monitoring um, by remote sensing. So in other words, there are uncertainties that occur at each one of these scales. And then what we do is try to merge different sources of evidence at different temporal scale and different spatial scales in order to constrain as much as we can, as best as we can, the sources of uncertainty. And then this, these two are the scales where the foresters, the practical forests, tend to work mostly on. And so really the physiology started here to attempt to go at these two sort of scales to provide information for management. And then uh, more and more we find that we are asked to provide information also that has to do with, as is important also, the larger temporal and spatial, spatial scales. Okay, modeling therefore is uncertain, lots of uncertainty, and, and, and that's what is always remarked upon about modeling, and yet we do use models. We think in conceptually. When we think conceptually, we provide a conceptual model in our head, and we then translate it into equations. That's more or less what those models are, the formalization of our knowledge. 
So what do we know? Well, we know particularly for certain ecosystems, uh, you may not be able to read here, but what it says is, in particular, large uncertainties are associated with the response of tropical vegetation to drought and boreal ecosystems to elevated temperatures and changing soil moisture status. So they identify these two biomes, the tropics and the boreal forest, as we know this, the most sensitive ones. And they identify temperatures and they identify changes in soil moisture status as two potentially very, very important variables. This article is a few years old, but the situation is still the same. We're still trying to grapple this problem of how to reduce the uncertainty uh, relative to do the, the changes in to these two variables. And so really, we start down here small, a small spatial and temporal scale. We want to make this jump a a a a over a boundary and uh, trying to uh, uh, um, reduce the uncertainty caused by this upscaling process. No? And so we do that by making use, as I said before, of data sets that are collected at larger scales. So when we start small here, what we do, we work with traits. Yeah, we work with properties of plants that uh, have to do with the inherent endogenous functioning and we attempt to make use of these properties. So how does a trait-based model work? And so what is a trait? A trait is uh, any morphological, physiological, or phenological feature that impacts fitness indirectly. In other words, it does it via the performance of the plant. In other words, via growth, via survival, as opposed to mortality or via reproduction. And so let's take an example here of two, one, one, one simple property. Let's, you don't need to worry about what these uh, rep properties represent. They have to do with primarily photosynthesis. No? And so you have here an axis that controls one specific property that um, has to do with photosynthesis. And, and you have here another axis that relates to the water status of the plant. And so this relationship only says that um, uh, so, some, um, provided that the plant is very well watered, uh, its water status is very high, you have, you have some maximum rate. And then as the water status declines, this also declines. So because we believe that these are, uh, these are internal in properties of the plant, they have to do with one particular uh, endogenous state of the plant, its water status, then we attempt to interpret the intercept here and there and the slope, in other words, the sensitivity to water status of this property. So this intercept, these slopes are traits. And so let's assume then that we want to produce uh, estimates of how the water use transpiration E or the assimilation or photosynthesis A are functions of soil water content. So then, uh, then what we do, we want to produce these kind of curves. And now we can produce them empirically by going in the field and uh, measuring in space or in time this property, how this changes, and measuring directly these processes. And that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to start in from the traits that uh, the various traits that control these properties. So you have these uh, slopes and intercepts, which are the traits, and then uh, you put them together with a bunch of other traits, and then you come up with predictions. So that's all there is to a trait-driven uh, model, whether it's a plant scale or biosphere scale. There is all, that's all there is to it. All the rest is just math. And so how does the math work? For, for example, in this particular case, uh, let's assume that our interest is this property here, soil moisture content. So this property will change over time. Is a drying trend, rainfall, drying trend, rainfall, etc. So that you have a time course, so that provides a hue with the distribution of this property. And so therefore, because uh, you have this distribution and because these properties here depend on the traits, then all you need to do is to just run the model. If you get this distribution as an input, then you get these distributions as an output. And there you are. So then you can begin to play with these numbers and you can begin to say, well, if I, have was, um, if I change the statistical property of uh, rainfall, which change this uh, um, distribution here and these trends, then I will get uh, particular trends in um, uh, particular dependencies of E or A, transpiration and photosynthesis on soil moisture content. And then you can be also begin to say, well, what happens if I, instead of working with a plant which has got this slope, I work with a plant which has got that slope? And so you can begin to test the sensitivity of the, your output to the traits of the different plants. So what is the problem? The problem is that uh, we don't have to do with just one, uh, just one or two traits. Potentially, the number of traits which are relevant are many. 
And so even if you concentrate on uh, a specific problem, in this case, the impact of drought on plant functioning, and uh, with a focus on really the source of drought that can lead to mortality, even in this case, then we are talking about uh, really a very large, a large number or potentially a very large number of traits. And so people have scratched their heads and attempted to categorize them and think about, rank them, wh which ones are the most important, which ones are the least important. And so they have to do with leaves, they have to do with, uh, uh, with the shoots, they have to do with roots down here. Some are physiological traits, others are morphological or anatomical traits. And so we are, we, the, 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 the really the science really here now becomes the science of choosing the best subset, and the one that really summarizes this uh, viability and perhaps trying to attempt to find axes of covariation of these traits so that we don't have to measure them all, we just measure a subset which is representative of the spectrum of variability. And so one of the, uh, this such spectrum is called wood economics and it has to do with things that the wood does as a function for the, for the whole plant. And so one has to do with transporting water, so how conductive the, the, the xylem is. One has to do with the resistance to stress, a property that we call the resistance to embolism that I will explain later, et cetera. And so other things are, uh, you know, the wood store, store water, it stores um, carbohydrates. It has to be the, uh, mechanically strong to maintain this very long uh, um, um, uh, trunks that um, uh, through which the water moves from the soil down here to the top over there, etc. And then another set of properties have to do with what the leaves do. And uh, so I mentioned before, uh, properties have to do with photosynthesis. So most of that uh, stuff relates other to things that go on the, on the surface of the leaves through the stomata. Uh, so this is one stoma uh, that can open or close depending on the water uh, status of the plant and the degree of stress. And then it has to do with properties that occur here in the mesophyll, as you remember from your basic biology classes, that really th that's where photosynthesis takes place. And so I suppose the fundamental concept I want to mention is really this one that um, there is an, an, this trade-off between the plants and the mesophyll needing the CO2 to absorb the CO2 to do the photosynthesis here in the mesophyll and the water loss as vapor in the opposite direction towards the atmosphere. And so we refer to this trade-off as, um, as a water use efficiency. So what happened? Uh, we now, how, since last year, we have a model and we have several of them, in fact, that came out pretty much at the same time, that uh, are based exclusively on the traits of the plant and get rid entirely of um, um, empirical parameterizations. And they uh, uh, promise to predict uh, the behavior of the stomata exclusively based on the traits. So this happens for the first time last year, two years ago, 2017. Now there are um, four or five of them already on the market as it were. So what is uh, one of these factors that um, uh, controls the behavior of this tomata? I will just present one, and uh, this one has to do with the atmospheric moisture demand. And so it's a bit of a paradox here. Uh, it probably best is explained if we look at this slide over here. Here you have the bottom temperature, and here you have the vapor, uh, the vapor water vapor fraction in the, in the air. No? So there are two curves. One curve here is the, uh, the absolute maximum amount of water vapor you can have in the air for a fixed temperature, and so it's an exponential curve. The higher the temperature, the higher the maximum amount of vapor you can have in the air before it condenses. And then you have the green curve, and the green curve is the actual amount of water vapor that you have in the air. So what we think a plant perceives in terms of the controlling the, the stomatal behavior is the distance between these two lines. So if the, the green line is uh, quite a bit below the, 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 the upper line, then uh, there is a deficit of water vapor in the atmosphere, which causes the stomata to close. And so the, the idea is that with warming, we move along this axis here, and this line goes up much faster than this other line, and so the distance gets larger and larger. And so if you want, it's not soil drought, really, it's atmospheric drought that we are talking about. Okay, and so... From that complex picture of all the possible traits, I select here four that uh, are the ones that people have focused more about in the past, and I will tell you a little bit more about these four traits. Uh, and then I will uh, attempt to s primarily to show you how 
we can use this knowledge at small scale collected by on individual plants by physiologists working out in the field and trying to upscale them to um, um, larger spatial scales. And so the, the one property is the soil water, the plant water status, and uh, we measure it in two ways, either the con content of water or its water potential, uh, then the transport efficiency, the capacity of transport water from the roots to the leaves uh, very efficiently, then the resistance to embolism, and then an, an allocation ratio called Uber value. Okay, so you don't need to grasp all the details of the slides here. All you need to know is that on this axis here, we have uh, one measure of the water status of, of the plant collected at pre-dawn. Uh, in other words, at the end of the night when the plant is fully hydrated. And the other axis here is the same measure collected at midday, presumably when the plant is at the maximum, at the peak of water stress. And all you need to know is that uh, relating these two parameters, uh, these two measures, across a season for one species, actually it turns out to be useful to provide information about how the plants are regulated during the day and during the course of a seasonal drought, uh, its uh, water losses, trying to minimize its water losses. And so then we went out, uh, tested this theory, we wrote the equations, we tested the theory, and collected a bunch of data set and trying to understand what, what we, whether we were seeing interesting pattern. So I don't really want to tell you anything about the details of this behavior, what, what does isohydric and isohydric mean, but the only thing I want to focus on is that we published this index of this sigma property here in 2015. In 2016, a group of, of remote sensing people working with uh, a particular satellite measuring the vegetation optical depth using passive microwave noticed our paper and realized that they could re rewrite their equation on the basis of our equation and could express vegetation optical depth as a function of relative water content. And so in 2017, they published a paper where they had a global map of our sigma property, okay? So we thought we were working as simple plant physiologists at the plant scale, and uh, two years later, this has been uh, a global map of this property has been published. Okay, number two, uh, water transport efficiency. That's very simple to understand. It really has to do with the porosity of the wood. We have these large pores, which are called vessels or trachids, and they transport water up from the, leaf, from the roots to the leaves. And so they, they, the size of these pores and the number of deep, these pores controls the water use efficiency in plants. I'll come back to this later. Okay, this is a more complicated one that I have to explain a little bit more in detail, and this resistance to water stress of the plants, and particularly a process that's called embolism. It's not very different from when a diver goes deep into the sea, and uh, the pressure of his blood vessels change, and then it suddenly goes up, because there are dissolved gases in the blood, if the, if the diver goes up very rapidly, too rapidly, the bubbles come out of solution and form, form an embolus. The mechanisms of the biophysics are very different in plants, but it's the same process. It's called still embolism. Eventually what happens is that when the, oops, when, when the plant sucks up the, the sap from the roots to the leaves, as we do when we drink our orange juice, then we pull, no? And so the, the walls of this um, straw sh slightly shrink because of the tension. Well, if you pull too much, eventually a bubble of air comes out and expands and fills the conduit, it fills the straw, and you can't pull anymore. And that's more or less what happens in plant. So we call this vulnerability to embolism, and we, uh, we measure this with a property, with a graph that looks like this, where we plot here on the x-axis, the level of water stress to which we impose the plant from zero low to high here, negative minus eight. And then we have a property called the percent loss of conductivity. So when a plant is a zero percentage loss of conductivity, then it has zero losses. So we, we start from low levels of water stress. As we increase the level of water stress, then the plant gradually begins to lose uh, conductivity because of the formation of these gas bubbles, air bubbles in the, in the vessels, until we reach this point where the plant is effectively dead because all the vessels are full of air. That's one species. Another species has instead this curve here. Now, how, so how does it work that the vulnerability to embolism changes from species to species? 
Uh, this piece is here is very sensitive because already at low levels of water stress it reaches 100% loss of conductivity. This piece is here is very resistant because it reaches PLC 100 at uh, very high levels of water stress. Now you would as so that's the concept of vulnerability. Then there is the concept of exposure. When a plant is in the field, how much does it travel along this axis? That depends on how dry the soil gets, but also depends, depends on the capacity of the plant to regulate via the stomata this water loss. So there is a, a, a large degree of control by the plant on how far it can travel along this axis. And so if the plant moves very little, it will stay down here. If the plant moves much more, then it can move up to here or even can move over there. No? So we characterize the, the vulnerability of the plant by using an index called B50, which relates to this curve. Where does this curve sit? So P50 would be the value of the level of water stress down here when we reach 50% of PLC. So this, this one would be here and this one would be there. Then there is a the concept of exposure. How much do plant, different plants expose themselves to drought? You would think that a plant that um, uh, it lives uh, always uh, very close to water courses, it doesn't have very high levels of drought, can afford to have xylem built like this. In other words, to be sensitive. A plant that lives often in areas which are very dry can afford to have a xylem which is built like this. In other words, it needs to be more resistant. So there must be a coupling between the vulnerability, the P50, and the exposure, which would be the minimum level of water stress that the plant expo uh, uh, exposes itself moving along this axis. And it's really the combination of the inherent vulnerability and the exposure level that then defines the risk of the plant. In other words, how much the plant in actual fact moves along this curve to reach a certain level of PLC or along this curve. No? So the actual risk depends on the combination of the inherent variability and the risk level. And so we make another four, we need to plot uh, this, this P50 against the minimum water potential the plant actually reaches over here. And so we did this globally for about a thousand species, uh, grouping the data by angiosperm and gymnosperm. So here you have all these P50s here, and here you have this minimum water potential that the plant uh, exposes itself to as a result of the where, the where it lives in and, and it as a result of the level of control of its stomata. And so primarily there is a difference between angiosperms here and gymnosperms here. So angiosperms tend to live here in a region where the safety margin is very small, almost zero. And the, the, co the conifers tend to live in a region which is where there is much more safety. It would be as if, in other words, the, 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 the angiosperm tend to live in this region here, very close to the P50, where the safety margin relative to the distance to this P50 is almost, uh, is almost uh, zero. No? So all the plants will live here. Plants who live over there, they probably have a curve that goes like this. Whereas the conifers tend to be much more conservative, tend to live in this region here. Yeah? And so they tend to, the safety margin is much larger, so they tend to pre prevent the development of water stress and the losses of wood to embolism. So what does, what, what's the implication? Well, the implication is that, especially for the angiosperm here, that uh, seem, seem to show a very uh, strong convergence along a single line on this uh, um, uh, safety margin here of, of zero safety margin, it would imply that when we look at data globally, we would predict that many, many biomes in the world would be subjected to the same level of risk. Plants would have very different vulnerabilities, but because the environment is different, the level of risk is different, the level of exposure is different, then the actual threat, the actual risk, would be about the same across several different biomes. In other words, you move to the tropics, it rains very much, it rains all the time, but plants are not resistant to drought stress because they never experience it. If you go to the Mediterranean, plants are very resistant to drought stress, but the level of absolute levels of water stress are also larger. And so overall, when you compare this uh, actual risk, the actual risk is more or less similar across many different biomes. So this map here is a map of where people recorded over time episodes of mortality in forests. So yeah, that's what you see in this map, that uh, the episodes of mortality tend to be occurring across um, uh, more or less all the biomes that we have. The final property I want to mention is this one here. It really has to do with partitioning or allocation, if you want. It's called Uber value. It simply is the ratio between uh, the number of pipes that you have here 
and the area of the leaves that are supported by these pipes. It's really very similar to the, to the things that have to do with um, uh, plumbing in your house for heating. Now, how many pipes of uh, hot water do you need to have given the surface area of your house yeah, or the volume of your house? You need to balance the capacity to transport hot heat through the pipes with the volume of the house that uses the in, in which that heat is dispersed. And here is the same. We are talking about the transports of water via the pipes and the use of water in the leaves. And so tropical, tropical situation would be like this, relatively thin stems with very big uh, leaves. And then we go to the um, um, semi-desert ecosystems, very small leaves instead for the same cross-section of the twig through which the water flows. Um, and so again, here the question becomes again, as in the example of I, I made at the beginning, the, the water status of the plant, how do we upscale this property to, to the globe? And there's a lot of information that has been collected on on the Uber value, and similarly to the uh, measurements of our hydraulic efficiency in the xylem, how do we upscale this trade to the globe? And so the approach taken here is different from the one I mentioned before. In the slide I mentioned before about water status, I stress the link between defining a theoretical parameter and then looking in the remote sensing about whether we had a, a tool that was providing information that could be uh, linked directly to that physiology. Here, the strategy has been to make use of these big databases. Uh, have uh, Now they have grown up in this particular case. For this particular property, we have a 1,500 species records across the world. Summarize all these traits and then see, uh, see can we see some generality? And can we pro uh, see some generality that allow us to upscale to, to the globe? And so we did it here using a Modis LAI as a start and to see what was going on. And, uh, and we, were fi we found that, in fact, when you group the data by biome, you find that this Uber, Uber value here uh, scales very strongly and inversely with the, with the LAI of the vegetation, which is what you would expect because the Uber value uh, depends on uh, uh, the size of these leaves as much as it depends on the size of the twig. And also we found that although the relationship was slightly less um, convincing than this one here, a very highly significant relationship with the efficiency of the water transport in the xylem, which uh, it makes perfect sense if you understand the physiology that goes be behind this relationship. If this one goes one way, this has got to go the opposite way. In other words, of the four fundamental traits that I mentioned at the beginning, for three of them, we appear to have a tool for upscaling this uh, plant level measurements to the globe. Okay, the final part of my talk is uh, I have talked about these uh, four properties and then I intend to give you a bit more of three different examples of how we apply this knowledge of trades to make predictions of three different processes. So the first one has to do with things that um, uh, people here uh, do, and I, I chose to focus on one example from Annie Delorier and Sergio Rossi's uh, work. They, um, and in other words, uh, uh, trying to understand more of the physiology of wood production. Of that, uh, uh, we start from flow cells here. That's where the uh, sugars come down from the leaves, and then. Uh, uh, the cambial cells where the new do, uh, xylem cells are produced, etc., etc., until you reach the stage of mature dead cells. Now, there are a number of environmental factors here that affect all these processes, the photoperiod, the temperature, the soil moisture, the sugar availability, etc. And so it's an interesting uh, case here to, exp um, 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 to mention here because, first of all, um, uh, uh, of the work that uh, uh, Sergio and Ani and other groups have done to develop this uh, sophisticated tool for quantifying these transitions you know, in, uh, in stages of development uh, in the xylem in relation to the phenology that also is measured in the canopy. Um, and it's interesting because also I think provides us lots of opportunity. This is... Um, uh, an example, the, uh, if you go back to our di diagram of the tree here, with, which represents all the processes that have to do with water uptake, water transport, and water use. So these pipes here are the pipes that transport water to the leaves. At the same time, the water status of the plant then controls the production. We saw this here. 
via soil moisture. So there is a very nice feedback loop here between how many pipes the plant needs to produce to satisfy these needs. And at the same time, this eventually ends up feeding back to the cambial activity down here to control the amount of cells which are need to be produced. These kind of sort of ecological questions, wha how do these feedbacks work? You know, what are the trade-offs? It's a very detailed physiology, but if we understand, uh, if we find a simple way to represent these uh, processes, then, uh, then we make a big jump in terms of understanding. They can go straight into the global, in the global uh, DGVMs because currently these processes of growth are either not represented in global models or they're represented in a very, very empirical fashion. So any small progress we make at this scale actually has the potential to have major implications. Second example has to do with mortality induced by drought. Uh, physiologists have spent about a decade or, or more uh, uh, recently in, 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 the last, yeah, in the last decade to try and figure out the mechanisms, inverted commas, the mechanisms of mortality. Why, how do trees die? And um, of course we know that's complex. We know that it's not just the uh, physiological status of the tree. Often there, are involve, there is involvement of uh, other biotic agents. They may be parasites, uh, they may be insects, they may be pathogens. There is a vast array of organisms that interact with trees. We potentially have a role here. And physiology is zooming on the physiology status, on the ground that uh, uh, pro probably what happens here in, in terms of this, uh, of this interaction here is that this component here must uh, interact with this other component to lead to death. And so physiologists spent about 10 years trying to think whether effectively trees died of hunger or thirst, to simplify. So uh, if the stomata close up very much because the plants are stressed, so they prevent water loss, then they don't do photosynthesis, so they run up this alley of carbon starvation, they die of hunger. On the other hand, if they clip the stomata uh, close, but they fail to do that very effectively, they run into the risk of uh, embolism and they go down this alley of hydraulic failure. And so either one then will should lead eventually to interaction with insects or pathogens and then death. So now we know that uh, this hypothesis was too simple, doesn't work, and we spent about 10 years testing it. Okay, so we summarize the data here of all available experiments uh, until uh, two years ago, and we chose two axes. One is uh, the availability of non-structural carbohydrates here, and here is the percentage loss of conductivity leading to failure. So if you are uh, in this axis here at zero, it means that the treatment is equal to the control. If you are down here, it means that the treatment of drought has more carbohydrates stored than the, con than the control. Or otherwise, it here, if you are here, it means that the drought treatment has less carbohydrate than the control. And here, if you are here, it means you, are, you don't have any your PLC is zero, you don't, you don't have any loss of conductivity. If you're down here, you have lost 100%. So the living plants that live in this region here, on this axis you go to carbon starvation, on this axis you go to hydraulic failure. Well, surprisingly, we found that all the plants live there. It's, I found it myself at the end, scratching my head and thinking, well, perhaps we could have predicted that ourselves before. It never is one single cause. It always is a combination of causes. You know, plants are not underbuilt to fail always by one agent. You know. They always end up failing by multiple ways. And so I'm also more or less what we uh, in, uh, understood at the end of this exercise. Okay, and then second, second example, uh, uh, going on with again the issue of tree mortality. Now we have enough information coming from this relationship that the people from remote sensing have developed in collaboration with the physiology that now, now this principle can be applied at regional scale. This is one example from the same group that I showed you before working on, on passive remote sensing. They employ data from California. They looked at this long-term drought that I think started in 2012 and then uh, picked in 2015. And they attempted to use those principles of, uh, of uh, the passive remote sensing to identify areas of mortality, you know? and, and they got reasonably good rela relationships between observations of death and uh, mod modeled uh, death. And so uh, perhaps the most interesting aspect here is that they then tested the statistical model, sorry, oh yeah, uh, that uh, include uh, different, different variable types, some related to topography, some related to climate, and some related to vegetation, the most important of which was this relative water content from a satellite. 
And so this, uh, this axis here is the relative improvement in the model, depending on which variable you use. And so very interestingly, the best uh, property, the best variable explaining the improving the model in predicting mortality was in fact this property measured by the satellite, which had to do with the water status of the plant. So I think uh, there's a lot can be done here, and there's a lot of potential, and uh, lots of also progress in by lots of groups who do remote sensing here. Finally, I want to tell, tell you a little bit about the uh, third example. That, uh, this is the prediction of water flux is a larger scale. So we start from traits. We want to predict uh, uh, how water used by plants and potentially also photosynthesis. And so this is one particular slide, which I think is extremely illuminating. Uh, you have uh, measurements of of this property done at the at biome scale for individual stands and also then by models. And what we plot here is uh, the proportion by which the evapotranspiration of the ecosystem is actually due to the water flow through the trees, the transpiration, is the proportion of the ET which is made up of T. Now, global models, in fact, models the components of ET. They tell you the model uh, uh, the evaporation from the soil, the evaporation from the wet canopy, the transpiration through the trees. However, the measurements which people employ are always measures of ET. And so what happens that, uh, first of all, there are very few measurements of ET and T combined. And so the ratio of T over the ET is extremely variable, as far as we know now, across biomes. And perhaps more worryingly is that when we look at models, uh, they seem to do a very good job in terms of their internal variability, but the bias from one model to another is incredible. And in fact, the bias from model to, bi mo model, to model spans almost the whole range of the values available in the literature. If we use a third a method, the isotope method, it gives an entirely different answer from the actual measurements on catchment level or, or plot level. And so uh, it's a big question here, and, and there is a big uh, a lot of people working on this question of how we reduce the uncertainty in this pr problem. And so one way of doing this is to um, use data, uh, use the same approach, uh, collect as much data as we can. And so this is an exercise that my colleague here at CREAF, uh, Rafael Poyatos, is doing. Uh, he managed to collect subflow uh, data sets from more than 200 sites, more than 2003. Each data set is... Um, half hour to an hour, so it's a lot of data points for all these sites, and the attempt is to see whether we can uh, um, use all this data, condense all this data into more general understanding of the behavior of water used by trees, and then see how well this relates to measurements of uh, evapotranspiration at the ecosystem scale. And this is a slightly more advanced exercise at the global scale. This is the last example I'm going to show you. Um, um, I, I, I was interested in uh, making use of my understanding of, of um, predictions of water fluxes using traits at the global scale. I have a good contact and good collaboration with people working on global dynamic vegetation models in the United Kingdom. The, most the one that is developed is called JULES. So it's called... Uh, it's a model that represents the behavior of the vegetation at a global scale, and it's dynamic in the sense that uh, it runs over time, a small time scale, but also long time scale. So it represents, attempts to represent processes such as competition, mortality, recruitment, development of canopy, et cetera, et cetera, like all the major uh, DGVMs do. And so my interest was really making use of these global databases of hydraulics that we had developed and trying to see whether we could use them to improve the estimates of productivity, gross primary productivity that um, people measure in the field at the ecosystem scale. Um, and so um, these are just a few examples for different biomes that we attempted. And so these are all preliminary. We, they are currently undergoing the review. But I just show them to you to, to make the point that the, you know, often we, we appear to see at this stage that this green point, green line here, gets closer to the measurements, which are uh, this um, gray scale points and lines, no? and relative to the earlier versions of joules, which instead do did a, a worse job in predicting predicting this property. We are still far away from refining the model, but I think it shows primarily, really, again, this issue. Um, the, 
the reason for doing this exercise in the first place was because in 2017, we published with Sperry that paper where for the first time, we could predict stomatal behavior only based on hydraulics. Two years later, this has made its way to a global DGVM to predict the behavior and water use by the vegetation. So again, we started from uh, you know, three or four physiologists whose interest only was to focus at a very small scale and uh, it's just a small physiological process. And you go then and talk to the modelers and they represent hundreds or thousands of processes, but they say, well, this process, we don't do it well. Perhaps there is scope to collaborate. And two years later, it's already there. Okay, so that's uh, more or less closes the, um, my talk. Really, what I attempted to do uh, was three things here. I attempted to give you sort of an overview of the, the tool, tools that we have available nowadays that um, you also, most, many of you, I suppose, are also using one way or another for your work. I then zoomed in and trying to focus on this topic of drought uh, as an example and trying to show how knowledge of this small scale can help to, um, um, f first of all, identify important traits. And finally, uh, I, I chose three simple examples from the, st the tree level, the stand level, and the global level to show you how then we apply this knowledge of traits at the global scale. And so just concluding, I thought I would just leave you with some questions. I think you're very lucky as a, a bunch of students. When I started, we didn't have all these tools. We had no omics world, it just didn't exist. Um, remote sensing did exist, but I had no access to it whatsoever. It was just too complicated. It was somebody that somebody else with a physics, physics degree would do, and I just couldn't talk to those guys. Even in the middle, uh, the development of the uh, databases or development of um, networks for in inventory, etc., were much far uh, ahead that they are today. So you have a massive increase in the tools available. And so I guess the message is that we have many more worries about the planet now currently, but our knowledge is advancing really, really fast. And so you have great potential to think about the, uh, how your little piece of work, it's always a little piece of work, how that fits in into a bigger scheme of things. And I guess uh, the other second, oops, the second question really was uh, how do we make sense of these two scale? And I, 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 as a physiologist, I want to understand the nature, but then I need to talk to people who want to make predictions and there's always li a little bit of conflict there. They go hand in hand, it's about the same question, but it's just not really the same question. The tools are very, very different. So you need to think about that too. Then uh, that's more for me as a comment than for you, but. Uh, I always ask myself this question, do trade-based approaches actually help to solve the problems of the world? No, they don't, they probably don't. Where are the limits? How far can we push this approach of trade-based ecology? And finally, I guess for me, um, as a student, it was, I had one, one, one of my mentor was uh, somebody called Paul Jarvis, a professor in Edinburgh, now dead. Um, he, was, he pioneered this uh, idea of, of scaling up, going from scale, small scale to large scales with the focus primarily on water use you know, by stomata. It really, for me, was incredibly illuminating when I, when I um, talked to this guy. So uh, now everybody does it, it's much more common, but really this issue of thinking across scales, it remains a, a central piece of all, everything that we do. You know, all the ecologists need to talk to the physiologists, to the cell physiologists, and they need to talk to upscale to the uh, eco-hydrologists, to the globe modelers, et cetera, et cetera. And this concluded my talk. I hope it will be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. I would start with one question. Can we have a, a copy of this uh, presentation, please? Can we keep it? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. OK, the questions in the room, you have to raise your on apporte le micro, il y en a deux, il y en a un autre qui est là-bas. Euh, il y en a juste un qui est là, prêt à poser une question. Euh. Merci. Merci, merci. Ah, OK. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. So my uh, question is concerned to the upscaling of the leaf area index that you've shown, especially to the map that you've shown. So um, I, I, I 
find it very useful to think about how to scale it up, and um, I certainly agree that, that we have the tools to do it, but how, how much can we actually trust these kind of maps, like especially for a trade like, like Leaf Area Index, where the variability is very high. I've seen the map, I mean, there were values where there is no forest, um, so like we're like it like these maps come with like a huge range of of, of variants and like a, a, a large standard deviation. Could you just maybe comment on um, how much we can trust these kind of maps now until we have more data? This one here? Um, no, like the 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 map that you've shown with the with the LII. Yes, yeah, this one. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. I, I, I completely agree. And um, there are a number of um, issues that need to be addressed when you look at this into detail, of course. F for me, um, the attempt there was a preliminary one to see whether the scaling is uh, conceptually possible, because it's never been done before. And so uh, while I agree that there is uh, room for then improving methods and refining it. I think it's nonetheless important at the beginning to show that you can attempt to do that and um, you get sensible numbers. So what are the, there are many, many things that you can do to uh, reduce the uncertainty. The advantage of um, some data set, some approaches of by remote sensing is that they could provide you a very long time series. So you can look at the dynamics of that, uh, that side time series. In my case, that was not really the primary focus. I was not really looking at a trait that varied over time. I only have a record in a point in time when it was measured for that species. In fact, I do not even know exactly where it was taken in the conditions of the trees because the databases are too large to provide all that source of uh, background information to allow you to contextualize. So there is a lot of uncertainties on the side of the remote sensing and also on the side of the traits. You know? and nonetheless, if we don't attempt to constrain one scale with the other, then um, you know, it, it, it's, it's like in the models. It's not like the models are wrong and the data are right. The models are wrong and the data are also wrong in some respect. You know? every, every component of our knowledge is a subject to uncertainty. The best we can do is try to uh, pull them together. So uh, that's really preliminary, but I think it's still worth saying this. We, merci, grazie. Um, I was curious when you talk about the traits, that was your third question, and you said it was sort of a question to yourself. Ah, yeah, okay, thank you. I, I saw you looking. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and there's a lot of work coming out recently that, I mean, the way you sort of presented, there's taxonomic groups that have given traits, and I think there's a lot of work coming out more recently that's that's showing there's a lot of intraspecific variability and, and that it's often larger than, than the between species variability. And so I was just wondering how you would fit this into your reflections or, yeah. or, or, or your message to, to people. Yeah, indeed, uh, that's definitely important for various reasons. Um, and th that your, your question has two dimensions. One is to do with um, taxonomy and phylogeny, potentially. Signals have to do with that. That's a completely, um, it's a whole field of research. And definitely, we have, uh, we are attempting now to develop a phylogeny for our data sets and see whether we can see phylogenetic signals. The complexity there primarily come comes from the fact that many of those traits come from the tropics. We have very good phylogeny for temperate and boreal trees, very poor uh, at the species level for, um, for tropical trees. So we need to, you need to work with taxonomists and phylogenists who, who know that topic well. Then the, fun the other question which you raise is the issue of intraspecific variability, which is also very, very relevant. Um, I sp we spent quite a lot of time on this. And of course, that's also complicated because there is the dimension to do with genetic variability within a species and the dimension to do with the plasticity. And plasticity, actually, we don't understand what plasticity very much is, really. It's everything that kind of changes here and there. Why does it change? We don't know. Some properties change, others don't. And so there's a whole set of literature there talking about this, and uh, acclimation especially, which also is often poorly defined. 
in the context of water relations. You can think of properties that the plant attempts to ma maintain almost at a homeostatic level. No? And other properties need to change in order for that to remain at the homeostatic level. When we did this kind of a conceptual ex exercise for Catalonia, first of all, we find that um, uh, formulating the problem is still very, very difficult. We still don't have the knowledge to understand how to disentangle these various relationships. In terms of the specifics of the hydraulics, we don't find that uh, the intraspecific variability is 100% uh, of the mean for the species. We normally find for those traits which are, which is a, that is in the order of um, a 20 to 30%. It's larger for some traits, poorer for other traits. And so we go back to that question. Why is it larger for some traits, maybe 50, 60% or more? Why is it only 10% or 20% for other traits? Is it because these ones are the homostatic ones that the plants attempt to maintain? And in order to do that, the other one vary when the um, environment varies to retain that. And so we, don't, we are not there yet. We don't understand what acclimation really is. Thank you very much for your response. And je pense qu'on va mettre fin tout de suite à la période de questions. Deux, deux belles questions, deux belles grandes réponses. Donc, euh, on va s'en tenir à l'horaire. Euh, par contre, on a un petit présent pour notre euh, conférencier. Euh, Valentina et Ping ont quelque chose à remettre. Euh, Peut-être des explications qui vont avec ça, c'est ça, Valentina? Si tu vas faire ça au micro, s'il te plaît. En effet, pour euh, cette occasion, on a choisi pour le conférencier un cadeau très lié à cette région. Il s'agit d'une sculpture en bois et réalisée par un artiste très connu de la région qui s'appelle Victor Daller. Et donc, euh, voici <rire> la sculpture. Thank you very much once again. Merci beaucoup. Donc, c'est le temps de la pause. Euh, juste pour vous dire que d'abord, euh, la pause est juste ici à l'extérieur, tout près de l'accueil. Nous avons euh, tout ce qu'il faut pour ce qui est euh, de la gestion des déchets euh, avec euh, compost et tout. Donc, euh, suivez les instructions, s'il vous plaît. Euh, vous pouvez aussi aller jeter un coup d'œil au... Euh, aux affiches et aux kiosques qui sont juste tout près, en fait, c'est vraiment à quelques pas. Et euh, rendez-vous ici même dans la salle à 10h30, s'il vous plaît, pour les présentations de nos nouveaux chercheurs. Merci beaucoup.